Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being with us here today. This is our May 2022 open house. It is our gift to the community. Uh, this is our 26th year in operation. So today marks our, well, that would mark our 52nd open house, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> um, we have uh, an incredible presentation for you available right now. My name is Elizabeth Papadopoulos. I'm the director of the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. And it is my honor and joy to be here with all of you today and to introduce our beloved faculty member, Sophia Pistrila. Sophia. Sophia Pistrila's work as a passionate advocate and supporter of holistic health started more than 17 years ago with her own healing journey. After completing her master's degree in science and engineering, she worked in this industry for over 18 years and acquired quite a number of debilitating health problems, which resulted from working in a high stress environment. This ignited her interest in holistic healing. Her willingness to look beyond the conventional brought her to the Institute of Holistic Nutrition, where a determination to get healthy again became a passion to heal others. After graduating from IHN in 2007, she has subsequently done extensive training in addition to her CMP in the following areas of functional medicine courses and other healing modalities, including reflexology, Reiki, NLP, and recall healing. With 15 years of clinical experience and over 13 years of teaching experience in the health field, she is splitting her full-time work schedule between her busy, successful ongoing practice and teaching at the Institute of Holistic Nutrition, the ever popular Nutritional Symptomatology Part 2, where she looks at advanced diseases. Her clinical focus is on degenerative conditions, autoimmune diseases, and cancers. Let's welcome Sophia Pistrila. Thank you. John, can I share my screen? Yeah, I can. There we go. Hello, everybody. So I'm happy to speak again at this uh, open house um, and share some of my knowledge with you. And today we're going to talk uh, the same, you know, the same uh, theme of the day is liver, liver support in maintaining health and reversing disease. And actually today we're going to go a little bit deeper into the functions of the liver, first of all. So with over 500 metabolic functions, our liver is the most important organ for maintaining health and homeostasis that's balanced in the body, correctly all the chemical reactions in the body, and reversing many health conditions. Where our liver is compromised, it affects literally every organ and system throughout the entire body our entire body. So in this presentation, you will learn uh, major roles of the liver in the function of our body. I'm gonna, just going to pick and choose a few of them, not all the 500 of them. The warning signals or signs that our liver is not performing well, so you don't know how to recognize it in yourself or others. Correlation between a poor liver function and plethora of health issues. Simple and effective ways to improve liver function including diet, supplementation, lifestyle, that you can put in practice right away. And Petra, actually, I, I saw Petra's uh, great uh, you know, presentation. She touched on some of those, especially the lifestyle and some of the herbs that we will talk about today as well. To understand the connection between the poor liver function and other health issues, one must understand the major roles the liver plays. So let's go a little bit through it. Uh, somebody, some of you or one of you does not, did not see this picture before or something similar. Uh, this is the big liver, or actually it's not so big by the way, but this is the liver. The left side of your screen, it's actually sitting right under the right rib cage and then goes kind of the middle of the torso would be here about where the, that, that vein is. And then this extends, the liver extends a little bit towards the left or the left part of the torso. Uh, here you have the stomach, and this green thing, it's the, um, 
the thing that it's it's the gold better the little little thing that squirts when we eat any kind of fats or oils and it's going to put bile into the small intestine so the small intestine comes right after the the uh your stomach or our stomach and it goes the bile goes right in the small intestine right here in the, the duodenum um in the back of the picture here you see in the back of the uh, the duodenum you see the pancreas and the pancreas puts its own pancreatic enzymes in the same part of the small intestine. I just want to vis you to visualize this because I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. So it's the same liver, kind of a, a different, a different um, story here. And it shows the gallbladder that has gallstones this time. So maybe some of you had the gallstones out or actually the gallbladder out. And if you had that out, if you, had, if you know anybody who had a surgery, this is snipping right here. And then resection, because obviously your main biliary duct still has to be there, otherwise you die without it. So the only thing that I want to show you here is that if you had your gallbladder out, the problem is still there. You may not have the pain there because of the gallstones, but you have stones on deposits. It doesn't have to be big stones, but deposits in the liver itself and the biliary duct. So we're going to talk a little bit about that later. So let's talk about the roles or, or functions of the liver. First one, digestion role. I think everybody knows about that. I just mentioned something about bile, the production of the bile. So what's the bile? The bile is water plucky with some bile salts, cholesterol. Yes, we eliminate cholesterol. And pigment called bilirubin that would give that dark, um, if it's healthy, that dark kind of brownish reddish color of the feces. When food containing fats reaches the duodenum, gallbladder is stimulated to release bile. Literally, it's, it's like a sac, small sac, and literally it squirts like a muscle and pushes the bile out. Bile emulsifies the fats. That means it breaks them down. It's the first time or the first um, um, phase where the fats are broken down. Bile also helps to encourage the peristalsis of the intestine. So how the feces of the stuff and matter comes out of the body practically and the bile is our natural laxative. This is the reason why people who do not have enough bile actually either they're gonna have horrible diarrhea if they eat a lot of fats because they can't digest those, but most often than not, they will be constipated. So now the function of the liver, metabolic function supporting every cell of the body, all of the blood uh, leaving from the digestive system, right, with our food or pre-digested food, passes through the hepatic portal vein. Liver metabolizes carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins into biological useful materials. So otherwise, the body cannot use those particular broken, broken down carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. Another function, liver is a warehouse of excess glucose. So hepatocytes, which are the liver cells, absorb much of the glucose coming from the digestive tract from our diet into, and they put them for storage for the later use in the form of what is called glycogen. Hepatocytes help to maintain homeostasis of the balance and protect the rest of the body from dangerous spikes or drops of the glucose level. So there is something called glycogenolysis as well, where the glycogen, when we need it, when we become a hypoglycemic and in our blood, the sugar goes really, really down. It breaks down the glycogen and puts some sugar, some glucose into our blood. If too much glucose is present, so it's not only sugar, but sugar is would be number one culprit there, but too much pastries, too much bread, uh, uh, you know, pasta, stuff like that. So it's too much compared to how much fats you have and how much proteins you have in your diet then there is a process, interesting process in the body where that particular glucose of the sugar is transformed actually in fats and fats are deposited actually in the fat tissue and the fat tissue is going to grow and so on. can sometimes also lead to liver itself to get fat. And this is what we call fat liver. And you have here an MRI, it's like a slice in a diseased liver. And you see here the fatty deposits that should never, ever, ever be into the liver. So the liver is the one metabolizes the one that, that moves the fats to and from the cells, remember the cells and the tissues, but should not have fat in it. So what's bad about it? Well, the more fat you have, the more, more of these deposits you have, or the bigger the deposits are, the, the lower the function of the liver is. 
And actually, you know what? I always cringe when I hear my clients coming from the uh, doctors are saying, hey, I know you have fatty liver. Don't worry, a lot of people have. Well, I would be very worried. And I'm worried as a practitioner and I immediately actually have a protocol for that for my clients. Why is that? Well, look at these pictures here. This is how a healthy liver looks. This is how cirrhosis of the liver looks. The fatty deposit is actually the first phase of unhealthy liver leading to fibro liver fibrosis, where it's actually scarring of the liver, cirrhosis and cancer, right? So in, for instance, the cirrhosis, cirrhosis of the cancer, uh, the function of the liver would be somewhere between 10 and 15%. So really, really, it's, it's before death, right? So really, you should be worried about Another function of the of the liver processing the body fats, the key for the key job of the liver. So fatty acids broken down fats are broken down fatty acids and glycerol. There's a few of the parts. The fatty acids are metabolized to produce energy in the form of ATP, what we call. And glycerol is converted into glucose. And sometimes it's used right away or again for later use is deposited. Hepatocytes, which again I remind you, they're the fat, the liver cells produce also lipids like cholesterol, phospholipids, phospholipids and lipoproteins that are used by the cells throughout the body. It's very, very important to understand the cholesterol that, for instance, you go to the doctor and going to tell you, oh, you have too much cholesterol. It's not coming, most of it is 85% of it is coming from the liver itself, not from the food that you eat. So by not eating fats, that's not a good idea. The good idea is to go to a practitioner who understands what is high cholesterol and to understand actually where is it coming from because there are many, many causes of why the liver would produce suddenly a, a lot of cholesterol. Also, cholesterol is a precursor of the steroid hormones uh, and um, adrenal hormones, for instance, that help you, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to react or not to react or to react to uh, healthy to stress. Also, all the sexual hormones are produced from cholesterol, converged cholesterol. Cholesterol is also like the phospholipids as well. They're in the membrane, every, every cell in the membrane, every cell of the body. So they're very, very, very important, uh, important job of the liver to do. Also, the liver processes uh, amino acids uh, from protein breakdown. So amino acids enter the liver. Uh, require metabolic processing before they can be used as energy source and because before they are used by the body to assemble other protein, right? So we have a pool of these amino acids and the body all the time makes new like tissue, like skin or whatever it is, uh, where the protein is needed. Detoxification function and my uh, the previous um, um, speakers, uh, Petra and Eva, was, were talking to some extent about detoxification. So all blood from the digestive organs passes through the hepatic portal separation. You saw that hepatic, you know, the vein, the big vein that you saw in the picture there coming right in the middle of the, the, uh, the liver. Hepatocytes from the liver remove many potentially toxic substances before they can reach the rest of the body. Sometimes they deposit, unfortunately, as Petra said before, into the fatty tissue. So we have to do something about that. Enzymes in hepatocytes metabolize many of these toxins, such as alcohol, drugs, um, glyphosates we talk about, right? Uh, pesticides, insecticides, and so on, anything coming in the body in different ways into their inactive metabolites, and hopefully it's going to eliminate them out, out of the body. Liver also metabolizes and removes from circulation hormones produced by the body's own glands. So why is that so important? Well, I'm just going to give you one example. A lot of cancers, for instance, as well. So why estrogenic cancers? Before, be, because she had that particular woman had for a long, long time estrogen dominance. Uh, my internet connection says it's a stable. I hope you're going to hear me. Let me know if not. Uh, the so again, that particular estrogen has to be broken down by the liver and has to be eliminated through the bile, practically through the feces. So it's very, very important for those hormones once they produce, once they, they, you know, they function, they do what they're supposed to do, to be broken down by the liver and eliminated by liver. liver. The blood purifying, very, very important. Worn out blood cells, red blood cells, for instance, are broken down with the help of other cells, copper cells that reside in the liver, actually. There's some type of macrophages there. And hemoglobin, it's a, it has a component heme, it's called, that it's a molecule containing iron. And that iron, it's recirculated or reused because 
the liver. If the liver uh, is functioning well, obviously it's going to reuse that. And pigment bilirubin is added to the bile to be excreted. And again, that's the one that gives us the color of the feces. If we don't have enough bile, actually, and that flow is not circling properly, like when we have you know, stones in the biliary duct or we have any kind of you know, uh, uh, deposits there and the flow is not totally open, that's not going to happen. So how are we going to know that we have that? Well, your feces are not going to be reddish, brownish, dark. They could be very, very light, maybe yellowish. And out there, liver disease may lead to anemia as well because they have low iron in the cells. And that's a very, very, especially, it's, it's a complicated process there. But again, just for you to know that, that the uh, anemia is not only because, you know, like we don't have, we don't eat enough iron or foods with iron, or we do not, um, you know, uh, um, have enough B12 or folate, or we have maybe something genetic like toxemia. Sometimes if you, if I have, for instance, clients that are coming to me, they tell me, oh, I'm anemic, I've always been anemic. So I'm asking, did you take anything for anemia? Oh yeah, the doctor or whoever gave me some iron pills and I've been taking them for three years and I'm still anemic. Absolutely, I'm gonna first look at the liver. How is the liver doing? And I can tell you that probably 80% of the time, 90% of the time, it's gonna be a liver problem. Um, before me, my colleague uh, hinted to the liver detoxification in the phases there. This is kind of what we talk about. So in SIM2 class, that uh, advanced symptomatology class that I teach, we talk about this for hours. So I'm just going to show it to you here and say maybe a few words in this particular uh, presentation. But at IHN, we do talk about hours and hours and hours about what to do with phase two, what to do with phase one, with phase two. What if one of them, it's a little bit, um, you know, faster than the other one, that usually it's phase one, it's faster than phase two, and phase two cannot keep up. What are the, you know, health the problems that arise and so on? And also we talk in very, very detail for many, many hours about liver detoxification, everything that has to do with it. Anything like gallbladder, what do you do with that, the lymphatic system, somebody mentioned already, and so on, right? So it's a lot, there are a lot of other things to do before we even think about liver detoxification. So one thing I wanted to show you here that in phase two, whatever we call it, cytochrome P450, the toxins, they're just called non-polar just because they are lipid soluble, so they're in fat, fat soluble. Um, there are quite a few reactions happening there, five different types of reactions. And we need a lot of cofactors or enzymes, not only metabolic enzymes, but another, a lot of cofactors in the form of vitamins and actually amino acids and so on. So just to, just to a few of them, folate, for instance, or folic acid, vitamin B2, uh, all kinds of Bs actually, not only B2, B6, B3, B2 and so on, or B12 glutathione and so on. So there's, there's a lot of nutrients that we need in order for the liver to work well. The liver is not just going to work just like that. In phase two, I always uh, say in class that phase two is a little bit more sophisticated. We need a little bit more uh, sophisticated maybe nutrients there or cofactors. You see there are a lot of amino acids. So pay attention. People who are vegan or vegetarians and you do not know how to combine the foods to get all the necessary amino acids, you will automatically have the space to going down and be weaker or lagging um, behind the phase, phase one. And at the end there, we have uh, things that can be eliminated from the body, which are water soluble this time, or polar we call it. And they're eliminated mostly from the bile and feces or the stool. And some of them can go back to the blood and will be fi filtrated by the kidneys. So another function of the, of the liver is the storage, provide storage for many essential nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Just some examples there, fatty acids from digestive glycerides, glucose, we've talked about that already is in the form of glycogen. Vitamins, very, very important. Vitamin A, D, E, K, B12, very, very important to understand that way. So for instance, you stay in the sun, you're going to accumulate a lot in the sun, you can accumulate that vitamin D in the liver for later use. Minerals, also iron and copper. And um, uh, there could be a glitch here, genetic glitch with both of them, where people accumulate too much in the liver and then the liver is going to be destroyed. And there are two genetic mutations for iron would be, uh, actually doesn't even matter, but it's uh, Wilson, Wilson disease for copper. Uh, there's another um, uh, um, genetic makeup or genetic glitch that you cannot change it. 
you have to live with it and you have to know what to do if you accumulate a little bit more iron. And how is that going to be discovered with the copper and iron? Just some simple blood tests will discover that. And hopefully before the, um, before the body is, um, you know, before the, uh, the liver is going to be destroyed or the spleen or you have cardiovascular disease and so on. Another function of the liver will be production. The liver is responsible for production of several binding protein components of the plasma, protrombin, fibrinogen, very important for blood clotting. So you can imagine if the liver does not work well, and that could be a, a problem with a life and death problem. Albumin also are proteins and then maintain the environment for the cells uh, in order the cells not to use uh, too much water or the, to have too much water. So it's that isotonic, we call it environment of the blood. Uh, and albumin, by the way, it's very, very low we find it in people with cancer. Immunity function, very, very important. Uh, there are what we call copper cells play an important role in capturing, destroying, and digesting bacteria, fungi, so be like funguses, parasites, and we're now blood cells and cellular debris. So where's the cellular debris coming from? Well, the cells then die for different reasons, and they are died, actually, not only for different reasons. Every cell in the body has a specific lifespan. Uh, just an example, the red blood cells should live only about 120, 121 days, right? Every cell has a different lifespan. Bile salts are natural preserving agent that reduce bacterial fermentation. So if we don't have enough bile or that bile does not fall properly, we're going to have something like or some people have something what is called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, candida parasitic, parasitic overgrowth. And actually, it's not only that you have it, but they can't even do, you know, herbals, the sun, some natural supplementation or even medication. They cannot get rid of them so easily if that bile is not there. Main health conditions linked to super liver function, low function of the liver. Fatty liver, cirrhosis, cancer, oh, that's an obvious one. All digestive issues, all skin issues like eczema, dermatitis, and so on. Hormonal imbalances of any kind, including PMS, um, estrogen dominance, PCOS, which is called cystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, hormonal cancers, and so on. Respiratory issues high blood pressure and heart disease, cardiovascular disease, all autoimmune diseases. So name it, Hashimoto's that I dealt with so for a long time uh, before knowing uh, holistically what to do about it. Uh, Graves disease, uh, lupus, um, uh, multiple sclerosis and so on. There are like quite a few hundreds that have a name these days and many others that don't have a name yet and all cancers as well. How do you know if your liver works well? I guess some of you may have come to this presentation because you know want to know, okay, what are the symptoms there? You want to know if your liver works well way before uh, your liver enzymes are elevated. And, you know, I have clients who I tell them, you know what, your liver is not okay. We're going to work on the liver. This is supplements and all that stuff. And they go back to their doctor or they have some blood tests that I tell them to do. And uh, the doctor says, no, it's not, nothing wrong with your liver. Everything is fine. You do not know, cannot know through a simple uh, blood work, only symptomatology. And there are some advanced other uh, you know, ways of testing the liver, but it's not the blood work that will tell you. When the liver enzymes are spilled into the blood, so they're elevated into a blood sample there that you give and, and the results come back elevated, that means that already the liver is breaking down. The liver tissue is breaking down which is pretty, pretty uh, far into the liver toxic, toxicity and, and you know, degeneration. So for all of you, how do you recognize that uh, your liver is not performing all of those 500 plus functions that we know medically or scientifically that it does? Number one, that's just digestive issues, gas, bloating, nausea, and, uh, mature, and kind of all of our clients really have those problems as well. Fatty or greasy stools, you know, those ones are floating, they're not sinking. Uh, and I always tell my clients, you have to look at your stools. Very, very important. It gives you a lot of information about your, your health. Light color stools, I mentioned that already, abdominal pain, constipation or diarrhea can go both ways. Hemorrhoids, spider veins, varicose veins, bit of taste in the mouth, halitosis. So that's like bad mouth kind of, um, you know, stinky mouth. Um, headaches and my, or migraines, migraines, and especially if they are like uh, very, very often. I was talking yesterday to a new client of mine said like, well, I had 
uh, in May, I had so far, she writes everything to go. And I had already three, uh, no, sorry, six uh, migraines in the last in two days each. I'm like, oh my God. So that means you had a migraine most of the days. So other warning signs, fatigue, not elevated by rest. So you wake up after eight hours, nine hours of sleep and they're still tired. Obviously that could be from other reasons like uh, low thyroid function, but the liver is a has a component there as well. Waking up almost every night between 1 and 3 a.m. And that's coming from traditional Chinese medicine. We're talking about a clock there that every, we know that every two hours we have a specific organ there that it's, um, uh, if you wake up a specific time, that's going to be about that particular organ. High blood pressure, heart distress, skin rashes, eczema, I mentioned dermatitis and all that stuff. Itchy skin. And then itchy skin also yellowing the next one, yellowing the skin without having hepatitis. That is usually, uh, not usually, but 100% from uh, bilirubin, too much bilirubin in your bloodstream that cannot be eliminated. It's either the liver does not make that bile, does not put bilirubin in the bile, or um, the biliary ducts are clogged, so you can't eliminate that with the feces. Dry skin and hair, because that's... Uh, that uh, shows you really that you cannot digest your fats. Chemical sensitivities, sensitivity to strong odors, so high cholesterol, that's given one. Sexual dis dysfunction, right? That cholesterol is not converted properly into the sexual hormones. Estrogen dominance that I mentioned already, PMS, everything to do with hormones. Some others, mood swings and depression. Yes, depression can be because of the liver. And I don't think I've ever seen a depressed person or a person that was diagnosed with depression come uh, to me as a client that did not have a liver problem and detoxification impaired. Inability to lose weight, weight loss with loss of appetite. So again, can go both ways. Weight loss with loss of appetite usually is because of the biliary ducts are clogged or totally clogged. Low immune system, like frequent colds, fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, all autoimmune diseases. So again, if you have any of those things, any of those symptoms, and look at your liver. You need to help your liver also if you have a history of prescription medication. And I'm not, uh, I'm always, I'm still shocked after 15 years of practice when people come uh, and they're under 15 different medications and uh, I usually work uh, with, with them. And after a while, I work with their doctor to be able to take them off medications when they don't need them anymore, right? So that has to be with the blessing of the medical doctor. Over-the-counter medications, especially NSAIs, which are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, which people, some people eat them like bonbons, do not understand how bad it is, not only from the liver, but how toxic they are for the body. Like Tylenol, for instance, I was saying, plus don't give Tylenol to your kids. There are many other ways to, you know, to lower the, blood, the, the, the fever, the temperature of the body. Tylenol, ibuprofen, all the stuff that unfortunately they're not even with prescription and people are abusing them. Illegal drug use as well, or even the legal ones that are in Canada. Preventing a reversal liver disease. Okay, so how do we do this? First of all, I'm going to talk about what's worse foods for the liver. Sorry, I woke up this morning with no voice. So I hope I'm still going to have a voice in the next 15 minutes. Um, so number one, worst foods for the liver, sugar. And I put here a, a picture also of the brown sugar because a lot of clients are telling me, new clients are telling me, oh, but I eat uh, brown sugar. That should be good for you. It's sugar. It's sugar, sugar, sugar. It has a little bit more minerals than the other one, but it has it's sugar. It has exactly the same negative effect on the liver. This one is a leading cause of the non-alcoholic fatty liver. So if you have, if you know anybody that was diagnosed with fatty liver and they're not, don't, don't have an alcoholic problem, this is a problem. Sugar, too much pasta, too much carbohydrates, breads, and so on. Number two, processed foods. And I'm not going to talk to you much about this. The picture says it all. Uh, there is something, maybe you want to write it down. Uh, there is a video, a short video, and I'm showing it to my clients who are eating this type of thing, like dog, hot dogs, even cold cuts. This is not food, by the way. If you want to have your own cold cuts, just have, you know, put a, a turkey breast or a whole turkey in um, a ham in your 
in your oven and uh, you know when it's ready just slice that and make your sandwich or make your children sandwich do not buy cold cuts um this is a video it's about how hot dogs are made and honest to god if you ever see that video it's a very short video it's only a few minutes three four, five minutes so write it down businesssocietycom how hot dogs are made and show it to your children and to your family they will never have a hot dog again and uh, number three, they're fatty, trans fatty acids. And uh, that's very, very important to look at the labels and read the labels if you buy food that is not cooked at home. Number four, the altered fats, is it oxidize or damage oils? And this is maybe something that you do not recognize is some of them that are not good for the body and good for, not good for the liver specifically. Saturated margarine, and I hope, my hope, everybody knows that that's absolutely garbage. It's absolutely a toxin that should never, ever, ever reach anybody's mouth. Hydrogenated and partially hydrogenated fats, partially as, as bad as it's, it's hydrogenated, full hydrogenated fats. So never, ever, ever eat anything with that. Unsaturated, fully, highly processed or oxidized, that are oxidized, they're oxidizing easily uh, in light or once they are produced, for instance, the sesame oil, peanut oil, even the safflower oil, fetish is safflower oil, it's in a lot of organic kind of chips and organic things that you see in health food stores. So um, the, you know, the health food store craze, it's uh, unfortunately, they, they, uh, they extended their health products to some unhealthy ones. And under the label of being organic, they may, may be organic, but the safflower oil is still, still not good for you. Why? The second it's extracted, it starts oxidizing, and you don't want to put in your in your in your body oxidized uh, oils. Canola oil, the worst ones, canola oil or corn oil, vegetable oil, anything vegetable oil. If you have anything in your pa pantry, I absolutely urge you after this presentation, go it, go it, put it in the garbage. Do not even give it to anybody else. It's absolute poison. Number five, alcohol. I'm not going to even talk much about this. Alcohol, it's a toxin. Um, that's not even digest, goes directly to the liver, and liver is totally occupied with detoxifying that instead of doing all the other 499 functions that we know. And people always ask me, even in class, they ask me, I had um, uh, the other class on Wednesday, one of the ladies in class said, well, but, but I'm French. I think she's from Quebec. Um, uh, I'm French, and we drink, French people drink one glass of wine, you know, at least once a day. And I said, it's fine, but... Uh, and remember that if you have any kind of health problems, uh, uh, your liver is occupied with a toxin, a tend, with a toxin that has to be literally broken down really right away, um, rather than being occupied with something maybe that's more important. Do I drink wine? Do I drink any alcohol? Yes, I drink wine maybe three times a, a year. I'm not like, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, uh, not, not a drinker at all, but you really have to watch what, what you put in the mouth. Conventionally raised animal products is another category there, non-grass fat or the other way around, please eat grass fat uh, animals and birds as well and non-organic, uh, you know, meats and non-GMO for sure. Commercial meats are highly arachidonic acid, which is um, uh, very, very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And if you have inflammation, you know what, uh, a lot of people are going to tell me, you know, like, I have usually inflammation in my hands. Or in my breast, the women many times PMS is on, or my feet, I can see edema is on. There's some inflammation there. I can't even close my maybe my my you know my fist uh, properly. And actually, I ask my clients to to show me how to close their fist many times. And uh, if you have inflammation there, you're going to have inflammation in your liver as well. So really, uh, we're talking about liver, right? Chemical toxins, including PCBs, DDTs. Uh, the speaker in front of me touched on that, environmental toxins there and hormone disruptions are concentrated in their fat of the animals. So uh, exactly like they would concentrate in our own fat, right? So really pay attention to that. All organic, um, non-organic foods, they should be eliminated. They all contain pesticides, sex, and so on. Uh, GMO foods is another one. Uh, Petra before me touched on glyphosate. It's absolutely the worst toxin you can put in your body. It's recognized as a human carcinogen. There's no question about it anymore. Um, you know, billion, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars actually lawsuits going on right now and so on because of the glyphosate. Um, 
it's for sure on approved GMO crops and the GMO crops on in Canada are canola oil. That's why you should never touch that canola, corn, any type of corn if it's not organic. Flax, so pay attention if you have flax seeds, you should buy, you have to buy organic potatoes, soybeans, squash, sugar beets, and tomato. Um, please go to, I forgot in, in, in you know, be right before the, um, the, my speech, to go to Jeffrey Smith's uh, website. So he has about three websites. Just Google his name. You're going to find out uh, the websites. And I forgot how many, I think there are 44, the last I checked, 44 other crops, not only GMO crops, that are sprayed with glyphosate in Canada. And one of them, it's wheat and all the grains, the wheat and the rye, all the grains. So why they spray them? They're not GMO foods. What they spray with that? Because they figure out that if they spray them right before harvesting, which is the absolute worst time to do it because it stays on them, the whole thing, they will dry them so they don't have enough, they don't have a lot of mold. Another um, uh, scientist to, to, to look at or to listen to, if you have, if you can listen, if you go to YouTube, uh, just uh, go there, uh, search for Dr. Stephanie Seneff. She's um, a scientist at MIT Institute in USA. Uh, she has some amazing, amazing, amazing talks about glyphosates, about everything, not only leading to cancer, but a lot of a plethora of other diseases. So, okay, so that's some of the bad stuff. What's the good stuff? So number one, maybe some people's like, seriously, I'm going to heal my liver just eating liver. Yes, the liver is one of the best organs, the best foods actually to eat, especially if you have autoimmune diseases, especially if somebody has cancer and so on. Here it's a beef liver, I guess, chicken liver, it's equally good. Cruciferous vegetables, fantastic. Cabbage, turnips, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. In order to be healthy, you have to consume one cup of these, one of these, not all of them, obviously, one cup of these a day, one cup a day. And believe me, it's uh, I, years ago when I started doing that, I thought like, oh my God, like seriously, every day I'm going to get bored. I'm going to get, you know, I, I can't do that. You can do it, believe me. As there are days when I consume two of them um, because it seems that my body loves that and my body is not getting into high toxicity. The cruciferous vegetables are supporting first phase and the second phase of the liver detoxification. Fantastic foods. Um, leafy greens, all of them, the kale, spinach, the chard, uh, whatever is in season. Beets, absolutely amazing. Not only to have the liver support, but also for the, go the gallbladder and the biliary duct support. It supports and pushes actually the bile flow through the bil biliary ducts and increases actually production of the bile from the liver eggs and I put there two eggs or three eggs here, whatever, two, two eggs, you have to eat the whole egg, not only the whites. The whites do not contain the choline. The yellow stuff, the, the yolks don't contain the, the, the choline that is actually, contain the cholesterol, yes, but that's not a problem for you, even if you have high cholesterol. It contains the choline actually that helps you to get rid of cholesterol. Also fantastic fats in fish, um, uh, farm fish, not Wild fish, yes, it's a big, even a visual, visually know that there must be something wrong there. Uh, there are some farm fish, there's some farm fish, uh, like salmon, this is salmon, by the way, in Canada, at least in Ontario, in Toronto, where I live, you can find it. I think it's Irish, usually Irish farming. It's organic farming. Sometimes it's not a, a wild, uh, you know, wild one that I have it. I'm going to buy organic farming, but even that one does not look the same as the wild one. So again, salmon, Atlantic, mackerel, sardines, herring, anchovies are the best, actually, wild caught fish has to be wild caught. Saturated, yes, we need saturated fats as well for the membrane, the cell membrane. We need it for the brain as well. Uh, you have to use organic virgin coconut, extra virgin coconut oil. By the way, Costco has it in, in Canada, a very cheap prices. Therefore, it's very, very good. It's organic and, and virgin. Um, they should pay me probably for the advertising. They don't, by the way. Uh, butter, fantastic food. Uh, ghee, um, and it's, again, it's clarified butter. That's what ghee is. Tallow, it's coming from, it's fat from the cows. And I see that in the last uh, five, seven years, and kind of going back to the you know, original farming and, and having that in our food as well, using it for, for instance, for with high heat, for, uh, for instance, um, uh, what I call frying. Unsaturated fats, 
Uh, also use some cold olives, olives, olive oil, avocado, avocado oil, nuts, and seed oils like walnut, flaxseed oil, nuts and seed butters. Garlic, absolutely fantastic in the form of supplements and also in the form of food. Uh, not only fighting bacterial infections and so on, stimulates the liver and gallbladder function as well, both of them. To some extent, actually, I should have put here, oh, onions are good as well. And they contain sulfur as well, fantastic for the liver. Citrus fruits contain terpenes, are breaking down carcinogens, are fantastic to aid the liver in detoxification. Berries, again, pay attention and do not eat berries all the time. You may become, uh, you know, intolerant. Pay attention to small kids, introduce them later in life, maybe at about one year old. Organic green tea, and I insist on organic. Why? Teas in general, even including the green tea, there are some of the most uh, sprayed with pesticides and insecticides crops out there. So really, if you want to have green tea to aid in detoxification and, and because it has fantastic antioxidants, it absolutely defies the purpose if you have one that has pesticides in it. So a little bit of best natural supplements to aid in liver digestion, in, so in liver health, can be found in health stores uh, in the form of tinctures, dry extracts, or, uh, you know, herbs or dry uh, extracts in capsule form, or even in, in, in um, some of them in powder form. Phytogemotherapy tinctures from shoots of young plants, that's, those are the gemotherapies, homeopathic remedies or teas. So are they equally good? Well, for instance, yes, they are. If you want to consume every day, for instance, uh, teas, one of my colleagues was talking about teas, concussions there. They're fantastic. If you have a health problem that needs a little bit more help, I would go to tinctures, the gemotherapy. I love gemotherapy, homeopathics, and so on. Some of the things that were already mentioned, um, maybe you know you have a picture of them as well, milk thistle in, La in Latin, Carbus Marianum. And with its extract, Cinnabon Marianum, is the one responsible for a lot of things to do with detoxification. So detoxify poisons, anything for environmental, alcohol, medication, and so on. It's considered a fantastic blood purifier. It has the, big, oh, the, the, the highest amount, actually, of clinical studies that show from any other plant, actually, herb, that shows regeneration of damaged cells or cells and liver tissue. Um, with the help of milk seeds, this will seed. So we, we, we do the seeds for that. Stimulation of bile production and digestion increases glutathione levels in the body, which is absolutely the most important antioxidant that our body can make. It makes them many times when we are sick, for instance. I had COVID and I took a lot of glutathione because I knew that my body is not going to be able to make that much as needed when in, in that particular sickness, right? Dandelion root or taraxacum. Um, I think Eva showed you, you know, to use the dandelion uh, leaves. Dandelion leaves are fantastic. They are, I many times I chop them in the salads. They are bitters, but also they're good actually for the kidneys. But the root is the one that we want for the liver. So it's so a liver tonic. It also stimulates the liver bile flow from the liver. It's used by practitioners in most liver conditions, including fatty liver, estrogen dominance, or any kind of formula problem or, or imbalance, skin issues, eczema, acne. Yes, acne is a skin issue linked very much to what the liver does and capacity of the body to detoxify. Can you fight liver fibrosis or liver scarring? I mentioned, I show you in the picture of it, caused by buildup of a scar tissue response to liver inflammation damage. The architect Chuck Lee. Sinara scolimus or Cinara scolimus in Latin, ability to protect the liver and help liver cell regeneration. Again, whenever I am doing, um, uh, you know, I support somebody with degenerative liver or high toxicity, I will choose either something that is in, you know, a tincture or make a tincture that has or choose something from uh, what is available in our uh, professional accounts that has all of these herbs. So I literally put you all the main herbs that you should look into when you do supplementation. It's also an antioxidant choleretic. Choleretic means that it increases the bile there, bile flow. So it's fantastic for people actually that do not even have a gallbladder. So it's gonna increase you take it before food at about 10, 15 minutes, even 20 minutes before food in the tincture form. It's gonna increase the bile coming from the liver directly to the small intestine. Berberines, Somebody else mentioned berberines. It's a class of uh, herbs. It's a family of herbs. 
Some of them like Barbary root, again, golden seal, Oregon grape, these are the roots that we, we use. And sometimes you, you know, sometimes we, there are quite a few on the market uh, in a capsule form that have, they called Berberins, Berberins formula, that have all of these in capsule form. So it prevents a fat and liver disease. And once it's diseased, it actually aids in reversing that. Turmeric root, fantastic. It's a powerful uh, liver protector, liver cell regenerator. I hope you eat it in, in foods. I put it even in my scrambled eggs these days. I, I love turmeric. And sometimes I make that turmeric latte with almond milk and even ginger in it, you know, squeeze the ginger, have a little bit of honey in it. It's fantastic protector of the liver, but also it's a fantastic anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. It uh, has an anti-carcinogenic effect and actually we use it even in reverse in cancers as well in the form of curcumin, very, very potent extract in the form of supplements. Burdock root or Articum lapa in Latin. So it looks like, again, it's a root that is very, very uh, woody. I use it in cooking a lot. And uh, now you can still find it, I believe. I usually buy it in, in uh, Toronto from uh, specific stores that have it or Big Carrot, all this stuff is during the winter. It appears uh, late in autumn and you have it the whole winter. I put it in, chop it, put it in, in slice it actually, not chop it, slice it, put it in stews, in, in soups and so on. Fantastic antioxidant. And it's a, the best blood in purifier. So if you have, for instance, any skin issues, acne, any eczema, stuff like that, I would go totally with large doses of burk root uh, tincture. But again, before that, you have to do some other things. I'm going to mention on the last slide, I believe. Prevents and reduces severity of liver damage caused by some medication as well. Liver is the risk of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease actually reverses as well. And again, I mentioned already garlic as a form of supplement as well, not only as a food. And then obviously we do extracts of it. The best actually would be garlic oil, tinctures from garlic or aged black garlic extract. Again, uh, that will come in a supplement form in, in capsules as well. It stimulates the liver enzymes responsible for detoxification. And you know what, eat it. And a tip for you, if you eat it, uh, chop it up and leave it for about 10 minutes in air before you put it in foods to cook it or before eating it on whatever you eat it on because allicin the very very important substance there is going to be activated alpha lipoic acid uh, it's one of the best things that you can give anybody with a liver a diseased liver um and best administered iv if it's a liver failure already i had a few clients that had the liver failures because of specific medication they were on um, some of them were okay with liposomal alpha lipoic acid. It's a different type of supplementation there that is much, very much absorbed by the cell, direct to the cells of the body. It reverses all forms of liver disease, including autoimmune because of the hepatitis C, cirrhosis of the liver, scarring of the liver, prevents liver transplant. And I can tell you that I did have clients actually that told that liver transplant was avoided. Uh, simulates also stem cells to regenerate the liver, diabetic neuropathy. So we use it for a lot of other things, um, even reverses that diabetic neuropathy, neutralizes free radicals created by chemotherapy, any kind of environmental exposure. Let's say if you have if you work in a chemical industry, right? You would have to take alpha lipoic acid on an ongoing basis. And anacylcysteine, I think these are the last two there. Anacylcysteine, a precursor of glutathione. Uh, I think everybody heard about anesthetocysteine in the last two years, or you should have, uh, because a lot of us use it when we're sick. Um, it's a precursor of glutathione. And again, we not only a precursor, but we can give uh, the glutathione in the liposomal from IV form directly. The anesthetocysteine has an affinity for lungs, but not only. Probably you heard about that already in the last two years, but also, it's a very powerful antioxidant, a free uh, radical scavenger for the rest of the body. It's also easy for hypertension. Inflammation reduces blood sugar level, insulin resistance, uh, reverses liver damage. We use it also all kind of other diseases, conditions of the uh, you know, degeneration of the brain, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, bipolar, OCD, schizophrenia, and so on. So a lot of uses. Uh, that's one thing that I would have at home at any point in time, not only, you know, for my clients and not only stock for my clients, but for myself as well. 
So there's some life supporting uh, liver health uh, things that you can implement right away. Avoid heavy drinking alcohol or drug use. What's heavy drinking? So people think that drink one one glass or small glass a day. It's okay. It's not okay. It's a lot of toxins. Uh, don't go by, I would say, don't go by Health Canada, what they say. I think it's like two or three, whatever glasses a day, I believe it is, and, and less for women. I would say one glass a day, every day, it's too much. Do not self medicate and supplement. Seek the help of a holistic practitioner because they know the order of things that have to be done. Reduce the toxic load of the liver by choosing to consume only organic foods, anti inflammatory diet, like a lot of curcumin, you know, turmeric, ginger in the food, and so on. Buy a water filter, very, very important to eliminate all those pesticides, insecticides, hormones, medications, fluoride, arsenic. Those are first concerning, by the way, both of them, um, that are in the tap water. Avoid also plastic bottles because they're using estrogens. Try to live a clean life. Reduce exposure to chemicals in your home and personal care. Oh, that's a fantastic uh, website, environmental group. Dot org, ewg.org, go there and they literally list every part of your household, like the you know, bathroom, your bedroom, your living room, your kitchen, and so on, uh, and possible toxins to look for there. But also, they have extensive lists of cosmetics. There's a button there, they look at everything you have to not to have in your cosmetics. There's a long list you can print out foods that you should always have organic and so on. Learn techniques to help you unwind with, uh, from your stress and daily activities. Liver is the seat of anger and primitive emotions. This is not only coming from the Louis Hay, but a lot of practitioners know that from energy medicine. If they practice something like that, meditation, yoga practicing, it's not a big deal. If you start doing it, just you know, have the courage to start it and you will see it's not a big deal to do it and you will stick with it eventually. Engage in gentle exercise. And it's something very tip from traditional Chinese medicine, very, very interesting, that overworked or overstretched tendons are impacting the liver function, which is very, very interesting. And we see that in athletes, actually, that have a lot of injuries. And the conclusion here, our lives, uh, our liver, not our lives, something, but our liver is the most important organ for maintaining health and homeostasis or balance, reverting, reversing many, many health conditions. Every cell and function of the body is affected by how the liver functions. Happy liver means happy body and happy mind as well. You know, think about that depression link there. Important to remember that you not to ignore every early signs of liver weakness before it's too late or before it goes into that breakdown. Plan for meals that are suppressed, supporting the liver function, eliminate immediately foods that are damaging your liver. Resolve your anger issues, maybe stress as well, and learn how to deal with it. There are steps and procedures that must take place before and in parallel with the liver support, always. For instance, bowel cleanse, kidney cleanse has to be before that. Lymphatic drainage has to be before and during. So please seek the help of a holistic practitioner if you need any kind of help in guiding you with a personalized protocol for your safety and for the best results as well. Not only for your safety, but have results at the end of the day and to maintain those, those results for a long time. And if anybody would like to, you know, talk to me, um, I do all kinds of things, but obviously um, supporting people one-to-one, -one, it's one of them. And uh, that's my, you know, my cell phone number. And this uh, uh, name, Sophia Lena Health, that's the name of my practice. And I'm totally, totally, aware that I went uh, over the time here and I will just stop sharing and I will want to either read or maybe Elizabeth is going to tell me some questions. Uh, no, no, that's okay. I think, okay. Um, I think you answered a lot of the questions okay. during your presentation, which was amazing, very detailed, uh, fantastic recommendations and uh, yeah, superb. Thank you so much, Sophia. Uh, we have one. Uh, where, where do you buy, do you organic, buy organic meats? Those are grass fed. Well, you, you don't have organic meats and grass fed. So it's either one or the other one, right? So if it's uh, organic fed, it means it's organic. So there, there's still, you have to make distinction. Uh, so it's fed organic grains, for instance, or organic 
whatever it is. If it's grass, that means it's in the pasture, how a cow or a pig or whatever should be like, right? Or, or goats or whatever they are, should be like living their natural life, right? And they're literally in pasture. In the winter, they are, I you know the pasture is kind of coming to them. They are um, fed on grass and their natural diets and not on grains. So they're two distinct things. Um, there's a lot of, for instance, I buy my stuff at Big Carrot. Um, uh, there is uh, also, uh, oh my God, I can't remember it. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It actually is in Mississauga. It's a place that's kosher as well. And sometimes I go there as well. It's in, actually, it's in Etobicoke, not Mississauga. It's in Etobicoke. Uh, if you go Google. Blossom oh. Pure. Yes. Blossom, yes. Excellent. Yes. You you're so, right. It's Blossom Pure. <laughs> Blossom Pure. So they have all the organic stuff. They have anything from, even if it's kosher, they have anything from, you know, organic uh, pig to uh, lamb to goats to chicken to whatever beef and so on. So that's an amazing place. If you are in Toby on the West End where I live, again, Big Carrot uh, Row Farms uh, has sometimes, um, I see the beef sometimes. They have, um, uh, they don't have unfortunately organic stuff much, but they do have uh, grass fed beef these days and also Costco. You know, if you have a Costco, if you know somebody that has, um, um, you know, a card for Costco, go there. Um, that being said, I would be more interested in, in supporting the local butchers. There's a lot of local butchers in your area. I would support them, you know, first and then Costco, uh, the big box, uh, you know, uh, enterprises. And uh, ask around to see, depending on where you live, there must be a butcher that has organic food. I live near or south of Blue West Village, and we have like two butchers there in like in, in 20 minutes uh, walking distance, right? So again, uh, there's a lot of them local. Perfect. Um, and then Lisa had a question about cooking with olive oil at low heat. Um, what does this low heat? Cooking, uh, if you have, it's okay. If you have, for instance, if you use some water, let's say sometimes I'm going to do uh, you know, uh, I don't know, stew stuff, right? And I'm cooking not in the, if I don't cook it, or even if I put it in inside the oven, if I put it on the top of it, I cook it in some type of water as well. And in the water, you have olive oil as well. So that water is going to go to 100 degrees Celsius. We're not going to go to the frying uh, temperature, and that would be okay. Um You know, frying the eggs, it's a very, very fast stuff. I do sometimes in olive oil. You know, that's not a big deal uh, unless you refry something in it. But frying meats and stuff like that, it's totally not okay. Okay. And again, yeah. there are sorry, there are types of oil, types of oil and types of oil. Uh, it's uh, the virgin oil, the first breast oil. It's more, it's uh, oxidized very, 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 very fast as well. So you will not use that for sure. Just use it on, on cold stuff. And many times I add it to the foods. For instance, I cook a, a stew maybe without any kind of you know fats and when i serve myself or, or other people i can put and will put uh, you know olive oil on top of it so that's a yeah another way to do it yeah definitely it makes everything so flavorful yeah wonderful thank you so much sophia that was a spectacular presentation very detailed some excellent recommendations one final thank you to everyone for joining us today and being part of our open house. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if you, uh, and to the winners, Karina Bender and Mary Chu, congratulations for your student clinic. Uh, we will be delighted to get in touch with you to participate in that. And we look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Uh, please let us know session with the program advisor if you'd like to be a student for a day and our next semester is starting in September if you'd like to catch Sophia she teaches our symptomatology part two class uh, very popular excellent practitioner and be in touch with her as well and we do have a student clinic well the student clinic um, is uh, virtual, so it can be anywhere. So if someone's asking if it's in Vancouver, it's, um, it's definitely all over. So let me just see.
Yep, so the Vancouver campus, uh, you can reach them directly as well for the student clinic. And that's, uh, yep, you can physically go to the campus for student clinic. Uh, and we also have them virtually as well. So lots of thank yous for your presentation, Sophia, from everyone. Thank and you everybody for listening. And I'm going to leave. I'm going to let you yeah. <laughs> do it. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, beautiful souls. A warm thank you to everyone for joining us today. Uh, it's been a wonderful afternoon. And we hope that you got some great information. Uh, today's excerpts were three lectures given by IHN faculty members. So you get an idea of what it is that we cover in our program. And we look forward to helping, assisting, and servicing all of you for anything that you might need in the future. Thank you, everyone.